Okay, I see it right there. Yeah. Okay. Steve's going to stay and watch too, right, Pat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just eat the fruits of the labor there, the, the honey. Oh, he helps immensely. That's wonderful. That's so wonderful. Your first year, that's so unexpected. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness you were handy. <laughs> well, well, we'll try to get like a north and south end extraction set up. If we get more than one extractor. That one was donated. Wow. Hi. I see Dara now. Hi. <laughs> Vera and Pat, you're kind of out toward the same way because, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Pat is Marysville, Marysville, right? Right. And you're getting pretty far north up there in Snohomish. Mm -hmm. Right, Dara? Okay. Yeah, kind of more closer to Lake Stevens. Oh, and well. Ron's okay. coming on, and Ron is already met Pat. And he's in Granite Falls. Yeah, so you're kind of north or more north in that way. By Zoom, everybody can come, but it's kind of nice if we do figure out generally where we are in case we want to borrow borrow anything. Yeah, know. labor, muscle. <laughs> I always go, sometimes you've got tons of swarm cells and somebody needs a queen. Yeah. And it's just so easy to, to slip a frame to them. If they're willing, you know, you got to check that the hives are healthy and all that, but just sometimes and getting a $45 caged queen may not be a good solution. It, earlier in the year, a healthy looking swarm cell directly into your hive and it emerges there may be the better solution. So I, I, I keep hoping that we'll get things really going. Everybody keep posting to the group page, okay? And checking the group page. And anything I go over tonight that you need posted on the Snow King Beekeepers group page, let me know, okay? Uh, I remember to enable s screen share for one participant at a time. So if you have pictures you'd like to show of your hives or anything or questions, I remembered to do that. Somebody showed me how last time. Okay, I think, what time is it? Oh, I got it. Okay, I can go ahead and sort of watch and keep admitting people. So... Uh, I thought that we'd start with the quick business, and I really will try to rush through it. I hate meetings, and I love the one the thing about meetings without chairs make for short meetings <laughs> because people spend too long on them quite often. We are a five hundred one c three. Uh, we're minimal, but I we are through it. We got the paperwork for the five hundred one c three. Figured out the IRS 990 easy postcard, whatever they called it thing. Uh, the Department of Revenue for the state, I figured that out. Now we have a YouTube channel, which I know nothing about, except you can find me on YouTube. Isn't that kind of neat? I should send that out. But I'm a little embarrassed to send it out because I sound like I'm stoned <laughs> when I'm doing this presentation that got recorded. So I have, it's a good presentation. It's on the history of beekeeping. And I did it for the Puget Sound Beekeepers Association. And they called and asked, could you do one tomorrow? And I said, sure. Then I looked and I found out I didn't have the presentation ready to go. So I pulled an all-nighter and that's why I sound like I'm stoned, okay? <laughs> I really do, I sound weird, especially if you know me. So we are making progress in the 501c3. Everything seems to be something you have to set up and do more paperwork. I was trying to get a donate button for Facebook. I don't know that we will ever get that because Facebook has a no animal sales, animal slavery policy. So a bunch of people are on the board of Facebook is the explanation I got. And I think I'm being stonewalled. I've sent in the description of the officers and their duties, which is really to be truthful. It's really just three people. Okay, but I sent that in, and they don't reply. And that's how they stall you when they don't want to give you something. Mm -hmm. So I've encountered them before. So I can't advertise beekeeping classes on Facebook, which farther down here I say, please, any place that you know of a free ad or a bulletin board, let me know. Email me, okay? Just the usual email. 
eliochol at gmail.com. We still would love to get more hive sites set up. Two weekends ago, I went to four different hives. That was really neat. And I think it will snowball if we start getting to know each other. And rather than doing a straight mentoring type program, traditionally you have an experienced person paired with an inexperienced person. Many of the bee clubs that have tried that have found they simply can't meet the need. There aren't enough experienced people who really are just going to take the time to stop and help an inexperienced people. So Ron, who is here in the gallery, if you have your gallery open, say hi, Ron. Wave. <laughs> There you are, there's Ron, um, has said that he's put a post on the group page. There's the Snow King Beekeepers Association main page, and then you click to join the groups, and you go into the groups, and that's where we really do our discussion. He's going to start taking names and try to match people up, kind of. You sort of have to know the geographical area and like that. It, it takes a little work. Bee Buddies is just you want to meet with somebody else and look at each other's hives, or talk even, mm -hmm. just even – Sometimes you just need somebody to bounce ideas off of. You're looking at your hive, and you, you can take pictures, and you can show them to people, but sometimes you really need some interaction where you talk. And sometimes you can get that on the other websites, uh, like on Facebook pages. But the reason we formed the Snow King Closed Group is because it just is too crazy on the other ones. People on the eastern side of the mountains, I've seen them sort of attack people who said, I'm trying to feed my hive. It's June and it's pouring rain. And people on the east side of the mountains couldn't understand that it was actually pouring rain a week at a time in June on this side. It's just hard if you don't live in the same geographical area. There are a bunch of conferences coming up in October. I didn't get, oh, I kind of got the dates on. If you look on the ticket for the Pacific Northwest beekeeping, this top one, that's the WASBA one. There's two prices there. There's the 55 and the 65. It's going to be completely Zoom virtual. It isn't going to take place on one or two days. They're going to do a couple of hours a day. Some of it's going to be pre-recorded. Uh, some of it will have be pre-recorded presentation followed by uh, you can answer you can ask questions. The $10 difference between the 55 and the 65 is whether you filled out an application for this year or really late last year, you are considered to have already paid your dues for this conference, your WASBA dues. And that's separate from any dues you pay to any local bee club. So if you took a class, I sent it in at $10 of that, and they insist on it. I, don't, I can't get out of it. Like I said, there's no cutting rate deals on the price of the class. It's a fixed thing. So you should get your $10 off if you do decide to register. But I like the other one, the other conference that says it's October 5th, too. And actually, if you look right here, it's actually saying that it's the October 5th through the 9th. So it's going to be the same sort of thing. That is an interesting conference for anybody that's ever said, I want to do something on my phone. I want to insert something into the Hive and monitor. I want to use some kind of software, computer apps. There's a lot going on. So take a look at that if you're that sort of a tech person. And also if you're looking for a way to record keep that will work for you. And that's cheaper. I think that's actually in some ways the better one. However, WASBA is local. It is the state of Washington. So take a look at those if you have time. Classes. I was looking it up. We are up to, I think we've actually given 39 beginner certificates since last just last September. And the Zoom classes are a lot more popular. People can make it. I, I would rather do in person. We'll, I think we'll end up offering both when finally this crisis ends and we can go back to face-to-face, -to -face, even if that's with face masks on or something. And we have to find a place that will let us. Keep that in mind. If you know anybody who will let us, without, hopefully without charging, the Masons did not charge us. That was wonderful of them to let us uh, meet there. We'll be back starting the beginner class in September. Those of you who just got your beginner certificates mailed out, you know you understand that there was some lag time there. Dara had to wait the longest for hers, but very sweet of you, Dara. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, apprentice, the first apprentice will be starting also September. That's for people who've 
done about a year, or you, if you want to sit in on it, you can sit in on it, but it's going to really be for people who've done bees one year. So now they really have the question. Okay, my bees didn't build out wax when Brooke said they were supposed to. How come my bees don't read the memo and take the feed when they're supposed to? How come, you know, and if hopefully they made it through the winter, but there's also how come they didn't survive the winter? Or how hmm. come they had no mites and then suddenly they've got a mite load a month later? Some of that we sort of cover in beginner, but not very much. I'm really hoping a lot of people will come back for Apprentice. I have a list of about five names and let me know as soon as you can because I have to order the manuals and I have about five manuals on hand. So the first five people is no problem to cover. I'll be sending that out in like the next week or so. The email saying when and if it's just five of us, we can kind of pick the time and the day. I'm okay with that. I'm pretty much available. I'm the retired person. Tuesday, Thursday seem pretty good for a lot of people, but we, we could ask. In the future, we don't really have a board. I didn't know that 501c3s don't really have to have an elected board. Why would you want an elected board? It's a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, actually there is a reason. And if we want to do it, we should think about doing it in like October. Because for those of you who are thinking about, well, I'll go to apprentice and, and maybe I'll do the journeyman. Journeyman is when you've done three or more years of beekeeping. Well, journeyman has a service requirement. The 11 beginner certificates that I just mailed out, in it I put a copy, it's coming up on a slide. There's a log you do of your service hours. And if you're an officer, you get it. If you're a newsletter editor, you can count those hours. Bee buddies and mentoring, managing the bee buddies and the mentoring, managing the newsletter, writing an article for the newsletter, doing a presentation for your gardening club, and I have some presentation materials that would help. And you've seen my slides. You could borrow some slides too if you knew that you wanted to make a presentation somewhere. Hmm. So those, those are ideas that you might have and you may already be doing it, which is part of why I sent out the Hive log. I don't think we're going to get the Facebook donate button. I'm, I think I'm getting stonewalled. Financial statement. I keep promising one. The basic thing is we don't really have any money. But if we charge dues, then it makes it possible for people who might want to do things. Think about goals if you have them. I'm so happy teaching classes and going out to people's hives and I'm having fun. But if you need something more, let me know. And if you need those hours, you might already be doing something that counts. We've got to figure a way to send out announcements. They actually, one of the ways I sent out announcements was the WAS. Western Apicultural Society newsletter. Everybody should join the Western Apicultural Society because sometimes they have their conferences, their annual conferences in Hawaii. I think that'd be the greatest write-off. Um, individual bee club newsletters are difficult for the average person to find and we don't really have a want ad system. Craigslist is okay, you, but Craigslist actually has a policy of not letting people sell live insects and they also have a policy that if you didn't produce something for your own use like you deliberately split a nuke to sell you're not really supposed to advertise in there without advertising as a dealer hmm. so people who've been using craigslist it might shut down on you a newsletter, if we could get people to we'd have to submit every time the newsletter came out, the newsletter person can't be in charge of, of figuring out whether or not it's still for sale. So it would have to be a you send it in every time. But I was thinking that would be a good way or a file over on the edge of the groups, the Snow King Beekeepers discussion group page. And there's files, which is where I keep sticking things that I promise to put there. All right. Let's see, do I have any more business or can we get on with, uh, let's see. Oh, I sent the progress form out. That's when people go, really? There's four levels? Yes, there's four levels. I'm trying to get mas master right now, which is the fourth level. Um, journeyman in the upper right hand corner. That's the one that says you got to have three years minimum experience, kept the journal for one year. Almost everybody should really think about at least, because you're going to end up doing this anyway, 
because I keep pushing, keep the journal. There's a practical field exam, which is super easy. I mean, seriously. Um, it really, again, and there's actually a sheet for that, so you know exactly what they're doing. And you only need, I think, 70% for that. Public service points comes out to like 50 hours or so. Depends on what you choose to do. Um, and you quickly run up 50 hours when you start trying to meet with other people and such. And you should have mentored at least one new beekeeper. Mm -hmm. And then master is a little more complicated. More writing, they want a little more. I don't know why. So I sent this out. This is a potential hive log. This isn't exactly official. On the right hand side is the old log that they used and it has a date of activity and item ABC description activity. It's just hard to remember. After three or four years, who did I help? Who did I mentor? How many hours did I spend? And so, and if you look at those service categories, some of you already do 4-H or some of you have already stood at a pollinator fair booth. Um, and beekeepers are more and more trying to work with the native pollinator people. Uh, it's good for it's good for everyone. Legislative food wise, when we go to lobby and such. So take a look at those. I sent it out, and I'll post that too if I haven't already. Now we're finally going to get to the winter winterizing. Any questions on the business? Did I do a good job barreling through it? I did. <laughs> Those who are in the beginner course, you may have already seen this graph, the beekeeper's dream. <sighs> you're gonna buy that package, it's gonna build up, and it's going to, you're gonna have peak population right when the blackberries are in full bloom, and they'll continue on but taper down and not eat up all the stores like the Italifornians do. The population will taper down, there will be some knotweed flow here, fireweed, knotweed, okay. And then you'll have like maybe 20,000, going into the strong, into the winter, but not too big, because they eat more than too big. Okay, hive management ideal. I thought we'd better conceptualize a little on this winter thing. On the left-hand side, this is the annual cycle of the honeybee colony. Again, you're looking for this peak, and this is for Virginia, but Virginia's kind of close to us. They're only about, I put it over on the side, I put the latitude, if, if you remember your rat latitude ring, rings that kind of go around, imaginary rings around the globe, and they tell you how far north you or south you are, 90 is the North Pole, zero is the equator. It's just interesting that we sometimes don't realize that we are farther north or farther south. For example, I will often talk about the University of Guelph. They have some really good videos. They have a good one on how to light a smoker, how to um, set up a nuke. And they have like 20 of these, and they're little bite-sized digestible pieces on beekeeping. There's a whole set. Paul Kelly, I'll mention him. He's the one with the smoker. He's worked years at the University of Guelph in Ontario. Well, you'd think that's way far north of us. No, it's south. And so in some ways, their weather isn't that far off ours. Yes, they, got, they get more snow probably, but they are close to, I think, the lakes. I have to literally look that up. But sometimes remembering the latitude. If Snohomish is at latitude 47, Virginia is only at 37. I'm pulling off these, these I'm rounding off over here. And quite often people will give you advice. Randy Oliver, I know, people say, well, he's in the same zone as us. Not really. Look over at those hours of daylight. And you'll see the difference between, okay, is this Virginia here? I'm really bad. Yes, that's Virginia. Okay. And then University of Guelph somewhere up here. And then Randy Oliver is somewhere here, yes. Almost Nevada, I think. It's like here. But we are up here, and that is quite a, a difference in day length, in the way the sun strikes us and such. So this curve will shift some with that. I'm kind of sidetracking, but sometimes when you're watching on YouTube, it helps to stop and say, how far north or south are they? But what really makes the difference, I think, is that like Virginia and North Carolina, we get a lot of, of uh, YouTube videos from the southern areas and from up the East Coast. And the East Coast has the Gulf Stream coming up from, the, from Florida, coming all the way up. We have this wonderfully cold maritime 
and Arctic type breezes coming down and our ocean currents come down. So that's more of a, an apprentice type topic, but I thought I'd mention it. Fall, we've already, we are already in fall. I mean, that sounds really weird, but to a beekeeper, this is really fall, even though we hardly got into summer. So we're talking the knotweed flow. We're looking at, okay, are they gonna have enough stores? How's the pollen looking? I was surprised a lot of the hives I've been looking at, including my own, weren't heavy on pollen. They're finally coming up a little bit, but that might be because I fed them some pollen up because they were totally out. There was no bee bread ring around any of the brood. Hmm. We're actually cutting back on brood. Uh, it's time to think about combining wheat colonies. If you wait a month to do it, it's a stress on the bees right before we go into winter. If you think you need to requeen, this is really when you do it. Give her time to settle in, make sure she works. Um, a caged queen and queens in super secure in, in packages and nukes, there's a 25% failure rate. Just accept it. It's, it's the way it is. And that's a whole big long talk. There's a guy named David Tarpy, T A R P Y. And he does all kinds of videos. He's studying it on why the queens are failing so early and why are we getting so many poor quality queens. There's, and he, he suspects a number of things. It isn't just the miticides and the, and the, the pesticides. It's also shipping problems. If they get too hot or cold in shipping, if they're shipped a little earlier to kind of cut down the profit margin, you know, if you ship the queen who's, who's in 14 days past emergence, and you can see that she's laying, and they're supposed to check that, and you stick her in a cage, she didn't get to lay a little while longer. Queens who get to lay a full month before they're put in the cage do better. They know that. But it's a profit margin thing. I gotta get that next group of queens out of them, gonna make money. So the queen shippers are part of the problem. We are talking about, okay, we're hefting our, our highs, we're going, are we gonna need fee? Or we're still waiting for that knotweed, and it should be coming in. My buds were tight like a week and a half ago, and I've got to get back there and see. Pat has great fireweed. I, I just totally agree with Envy because Pat's fireweed. I couldn't believe how much she has out there. Okay, and the mite counts. You hopefully you've already done that. And this one is the easy one. I, I do like this. It has a, a measuring line inside. I did for all last time, so I won't bore the people who came last time, okay? because I already talked for an entire class on that. But I'm assuming people will talk about anything you want to after I get done with my rush through. So you might have been kind of monitoring, but this isn't really a treatment. When you scoop your, ca your capping fork in to those drone, when this gets full of drone brood and you scoop out your drones, and I can explain that better later if people want me to. You're looking because a drone brood attracts the female mites strong more strongly than regular brood mm -hmm. and so here's a poor drone that's been took, click, i mean cut down in his prime speared and pulled out okay but it happens naturally too when you're opening up your hives and you're separating the hive boxes and there's that bird comb it's often drone combs so when you're pulling it apart take a peek and look to see if there's anything crawling and moving on your drones, that shouldn't be. You often won't see anything in the spring, but if you just kind of keep an eye on it, it doesn't hurt to know what's going on in your hive. We did varroa treatments last time. This should be on the page under files, in the group discussion page. Now, the actual nuts and bolts of winterization. You will hear beekeepers again and again say, cold alone doesn't kill. The three things that kill are the cluster's too small. You have a weak or small colony. And it could have been a late swarm or split. It could have been that the yellow jackets, W-H-Y-H-W, yellow jackets, hornets, wasps, came and robbed it out. It could be the varroa. This, they, they, they just are weakened. Often, they stop raising the brood when they're that weak. They could be actually starving. We have our summer dearth. It depends on where you are. Um, those people with lots of fireweed, for example, don't have a dearth right now. Those of us who don't have a really good, don't have something that's really, really good, tend to go to dearth. 
but I do get not me if my bees will fly a mile to get to it. And condensation is the third killer. Mm. It's not just the moisture in the hive. Bees are tropical. They like high humidity, 50 to 80% greenhousey type humidity. But they're okay with that. But wet, cold water that drips on them, when, especially when they're in cl cluster and they can't move. Mm. We'll go into cluster about why they don't move. Why don't you just move over if the faucet's dripping on your head? Well, they can't. And if you took beginner, you remember my tenth analogy for how that condensation builds up. That when the person you're camping with, it's just that you seal everything up. Oh, we're gonna be too cold. And they make you seal up even the top vents and you wake up in the morning and the whole, everything's wet. The whole sides, the walls are all wet. Stuff is dripping on you down from the inside poles. You're getting, there's so much condensation from just what you breathed out, your respiration all night long, 24 seven for a beehive. So that condom, that moisture has to be dealt with and it can't be allowed to turn into condensation. And you always have to autopsy, autopsy your dead outs. You really have to do your best. Take smartphone pictures and that's where a bee buddy, talk it through, try to figure out what went wrong. But hopefully nothing will go wrong because you're gonna do all this right, right? Okay. The guidelines for the store, that's the biggest thing. So we always end up talking about feed, and I'm sorry for those of you who just took this in the beginner, but ideally you will have, okay, two 10 frame deeps, or you will have uh, three eight frame deeps or three eight frame or three 10 frame westerns. Top bar gets a little tricky. It's gonna have to be at least that equivalent so you're looking pretty much at the 20 frames, depending on how deep your and how wide your top bar art is. They, they vary a little bit on, on how big the frame is when the bees build it out. And again, you, you need them to build out all the way to count it as a full frame. So half bees and brood, half stores. 100 to 120 pounds, including the woodenware. And the reason people say that is it's often hefting using a luggage scale, some people, if you really feel like you need to know, is it there, you can stand, if you've got the muscle, put the bathroom scale on the plywood and stand on. I've done that just out of, to satisfy my own curiosity. If you have any doubt, I really recommend you just leave the honey in there. Better to have the excess stores in the spring than have a dead out. Better to feed them so they have extra honey syrup. It's just, you know, sugar syrup honey is not the most nutritious, but it is better for them than dry feed. And consider a spring honey harvest. There are people who do this on purpose. They wait to see if they want it. The bees take care of it. A few types of honey will granulate on you. And I should put a picture. Karen Perrow, who took this class, I think the last time, she had ivy honey that granulated on her, turned into white sugar right in the combs. So she... She's gonna watch now. She said she gets a pretty good ivy honey harvest because of some hillsides that are right behind her. And so she's gonna pull that honey off next time because it's just gonna granulate. And it's hard for the bees to get to. Technically they can, but they'll eat anything else first. Now I, I gave you this 100, 120 because new beekeepers have to have some math. But really, you need those figures. You need the comfort of having something that seems definite while we're saying, uh, it's your best judgment, you know, well, you sort of, and yeah, and two people tell you different things. One thing you do have to understand is more stores are used in a warm winter than a cold. And I put in a few graphs later on about the cluster and the way the bees break up the cluster and then reform the cluster. And my personal tragedy was 2019, the snow fell and then stayed on the ground for five weeks, which never happens in this area. Snow on the ground for five weeks. Okay, and it was sunny too, and it reflected light up. And I had one hive that got fooled, and I never checked. I knew that that was a strong hive. I knew it didn't have mites. I knew it had plenty of food. And those silly bees, those Italifornians, they they got so much Italian blood in them. I guess they like big families, and they raped. They took every lick of honey or pollen they had. They cleaned the hive and raised brood. They thought that spring. 
down the, the corner. The daylight fooled him, which I guess I should have, um, I, I should have at least cracked the inner cover and seen what they were up to. I didn't think to do that, and I should have checked the feed, but I was so sure they were okay. Well, they weren't. There's a, there's a financial consideration about taking the honey off. If you do, and you know they need the sugar back, you have to do it. Some people say, oh, I can't take away their honey. And other people go, hmm, a dollar, dollar fifty an ounce for honey, and 50 cents a pound for sugar. Well, there's practical economics, so you decide. Banked honey is the best spring feed with one exception, which I actually ran into. If you've had an outbreak of Nosema while that comb was on the hive, or an outbreak of something funny looking in your brood, it won't hurt you to eat the honey. Nosema and whatever brood disease it is won't, won't hurt you at all. But if you do feed that back to them, especially in the spring, you're going to be hitting them with the same disease that they're susceptible to. And I actually accidentally didn't recognize that I didn't have a, a strong brood problem, but I had a small brood problem. And they did pull out of it, but I didn't help them out by feeding them back the honey. It's the one time. So watch for nosema, bee diarrhea, basically. Well, it's closely correlated with, with uh, bee diarrhea. Lots all over your hive, inside or out. And uh, the brood looks funny. In that case, just take the honey for yourself, feed them back, save sugar. And sugar, table sugar is plant sugar. Sucrose, that's table sugar, is plant sugar. That's why it's so good for the bees. It's what they would pick up if they went out to collect nectar. It's the most, largest percentage of the sugar in the nectar is sucrose, like your table sugar. And that's why it comes from cane, sugar cane, and from bees, is it is plant sugar. So, individual colonies and strains, you could have two hives side by side like that one. I forget how many hives I had that year but it was the only one that had that problem of deciding to raise the brood. And even if it had lived the next winter, I could have watched it, but if the queen changed, maybe it swarmed by disc split or something, or there was a supersedure, the stream changes. All the bees are mutts, and sometimes it's very difficult to predict what their characteristics are gonna be. So don't assume, do the five second check and save your hive. Beginners, you've already, if you've been to the beginner class, you've already heard this. Watch out, it's nature's calendar. And boy, did that happen this spring with the pouring rain. There's weeks, a week at a time of rain, maybe a sunbreak, another week of rain. But I think that the fall is even harder to predict than our spring. At least in our spring, we know that eventually it's gonna get better. We just have to keep feeding them if they can't fly out of the hive and get any nectar or any pollen. But, Right now, okay, it's the middle of August. We're having our hottest temperatures of the year. But actually, it's not that hot. It's raining, and I'm wondering what September's going to look like. Is it going to be a cool, rainy September, and they can't really go out to forage very much? And in some ways, that's good. I think they start realizing, oh, winter's coming. Or will it be a false summer where it looks beautifully sunny and the bees stay active and they keep trying to forage even if there's nothing to forage they keep oh, the foragers go out and they keep trying and they use up all the stores and they keep raising brood because they can't see winter coming i think we, we're at a disadvantage in that we don't have definite seasons on this side of the mountains i think it makes a difference anybody finds a good researcher who says it better let me know it's one of those questions i really think the bees have troubles we have to be watching and helping them out October usually is cool and rainy, but I've seen it bright sunny while it was cool. And again, the foragers are out trying to fly, they're trying to raise brood, they're confused, and they may use up their stores. Even if they had, even if you had 120 pounds of hive at the end of August, beginning of September, by the end of October, if you think something's funny and they're flying too much, I'd keep feeding them. There's only been one year where I fed them basically well into October. I said, I don't understand what's going on, but I kept the liquid feed because it was that warm. Hmm. 
critical questions. Let's see. Okay, so you're trying to figure out when the foraging weather, when their active storage using weather is going to end. Not we. That's the important one. I got a picture coming up for anyone that does not visualize what not we is, because quite often we talk about it for an entire beekeeping meeting, and then somebody says, "What's not we?" It is just absolutely critical as our last big flow for many people in the riparian zones, in the marshy river side areas. And it's important as to whether bees get an opportunity for cleansing flights. It helps keep their gut fauna, meaning they don't get bee diarrhea. It keeps their flora and fauna and their bee gut on an even level, the way it's supposed to be. And those winter stores, and make notes on all this for your journal, your hive log. And if you stop and look at it, sometimes visually people can stop and look at it and go, oh yeah, you're right. And I'm not sure how accurate this is. I'm working on this. If anybody else would like to take a better look at it, it this easily shifts. I think the shift over, like not weed, mine might finally be opening up. In other places, it opened up at the beginning of August. So this slides like a month each way, but you do notice we basically start running out of options about here. There really isn't much, even if it's sunny. Most of the native vegetation bloomed back. If you go back here and look at the natives, this is again, there's at least a version of this, a fairly current version of this pollen and nectar source table. There are a number of people who tried to do one of these. I tried to redo it and I think maybe Every person has to look at it and do some adjustments yourself. Some people are nowhere near the Japanese knotweed. I didn't even know there was such a thing as goldenrod in this area. I finally found some. Um, basically, it's not at my, my elevation, but I've got a lot of tansy ragwort, whether I want it or not. So, you might take a look at this. might make your own in your hive logs. Here's the knotweed. It goes up to like eight feet tall, and it is the only noxious weed that the noxious weed board in the state of Washington wants to get rid of. And we wish they would stop getting rid of it because it's our fall honey flow. And it's, it's this really dark, rich honey that some people get, and other people go, wow. Sort of, I'd say almost like molasses. So, as much as it seems silly to be talking about food so much, it is one of the things you can do. Uh, the manual explains how to take a, it's not really a fish scale, it's really a luggage scale, and try hefting your hive that way. I've always just looked down into the hive and then tilted, I tilt my hive bodies to see under me, hefted, counted the frames, and done it that way. Full or not full. But there are, there are like this list here, I could put this list on if it would help anybody. I think, the weights on this list below sort of look like bees and brood because honey can get heavier than that. So I don't know if that's supposed to be mixed, sort of, but I pulled this out of one place because I thought it just gives you an idea. If you're using deeps or mediums, eight frames or 10 frames, keep track. Liquid is the better. Honey from the healthy hive or your bank and you can bank honey in your freezer because it doesn't granulate as long as you freeze it. It likes to granulate at about, most honeys at about 55 and such. So you've got to keep them warm, like at room temperature up in your kitchen upper shelf. Or if you put them out in your nice cool pantry and you think the honey would last longer, it usually granulates on you, right? And then you feed two to one after you've given them whatever honey you are going to give them or let them keep. And if you're unsure, I say just feed it. Sugar is so cheap. It's kind of bad for our figures, isn't it? I mean, for our nutrition. Sugar is so cheap in this country, it's ridiculous. And you feed until the daytime temps are below 55 degrees. Syrup isn't gonna flow at below 50 degrees. If you've got it covered, and I'll show later how you have the insulation on top of your liquid feeder, you can probably go to 50 degrees. Just wait until they stop taking it. If you're using jar feeders, that's really easy. You can just see that they've stopped taking it. If you don't, then you better watch the temperature more. And a lot of times it gets so cool at night and just barely in the low 50s during the day, and then it's back down to 
low 40s at night. Actually, the syrup is having trouble keeping warm and flowing. Dry. You can serve, it's considered dry, whether it's granulated, sprinkled, you know, totally like you serve it out of your sugar shaker, a fondant, an icing type, or a brick, a sugar block. And I go ahead and feed pollen sub patties quite often. Some people say back off on those if they have a lot of brood. So they won't keep building brood, but I don't know. I, have, I can't control my Italifornians. Some of them know how to limit their families and some don't and like just okay sometimes you just do your best that is one of the reasons people talk about differences with carniolans and caucasians being more careful about their stores in that they will cut, sometimes cut back their brood if correctly they'll, cut, they'll come down on that curve that population curve that you're hoping that they will naturally control themselves and then but then the same ones that brewed down for the winter, sometimes in the spring, need a little extra boost to get going because they're slow to start up. And you need them up and running by the blackberry flow. I mean, honey's not the only reason we keep bees, but we sure could use the help financially and our bees could use the stores. So if you've been in the beginner class, you've already heard this, when do you feed? There's all these reasons. We just went through summer dearth. It's time probably to switch to the two to one. You sometimes feed one-to-one -one in summer dearth because, or partly because they need the water if it gets really hot, especially on the other side of the mountains. <coughs> and the liquid, the liquid there, see 50 degrees if it's fully covered and the liquid is actually staying at 50 degrees. But you gotta switch over to the solid if it goes any lower or they stop taking it. When you feed, it is best not to feed stop and start. And there's actually a research paper on that. I keep looking for something that backs up something that everyone says, or that I just know is true, and you probably feel the same way. I can know something's true, but I can't always find a backup. Okay, and we're past the BlackBerry flow. Some of these slides I obviously stole, and I just finished putting them together right before we started. To feed or not to feed, I use the Wall Street test. You risk as much as you can sleep at nights risking. If you feel like your hive is gonna make it, and you can sleep at nights, don't worry. But it's cheap insurance if you decide to just feed anyway. And so they make a little extra uh, sugar syrup honey and they have it in the spring. Right there in the hive, already warmed up and insulated in the hive. I like jar feeders, those jar feeders. They are a hassle, a commercial beekeeper wouldn't use them. But for a small scale or when you have nukes or when you're monitoring certain hives closely, it, the uptake or downtake, I guess you'd say the level of the, uh, in the jar tells you what's going on, tells you if they're taking it. If they're not taking it, better go inside and check, even though you weren't going to, because you were trying to let that queen mate or whatever. You were trying not to disturb them. Preventing nutritional stress really does prevent disease. You heard this from your mom, eat your veggies, you know, but it's the same, it really is true. For bees, they get less stressed. Uh, and then the new hives are past that, we see what's going on. And sometimes feeding, if your hives are side by side and you're pretty much in dearth, reduce those entrances down. But if you have any doubts, you might end up feeding the colony neighbors As, because it will help prevent the bees from just going around to the next hive and trying to rob. Go get a free meal. Take out. Limiting feed is an important commercial strategy. But for backyard, smaller scale beekeepers, Nah, think twice before you limit on purpose. It just sometimes backfires. Carl Creelsheim, there is on the top line. Feed continuously, stop and start feeding, stresses the bees, and he did this really neat experiment. Long, uh, decades ago. This is something that's been known for a long time. And I often warn people, you start and stop feed. One of the things that bees do that doesn't make sense to us because we think anthropomorphically, Anthropomorphicologically, we think like people and we think emotionally. Bees are very practical. They are little efficiency experts. If a bee decides that for the good of the hive, we need to cut back on feeding, we don't have the stores. They are very logical. They look at the entire hive population and they say, we can't raise those eggs. They follow the queen and they eat the eggs behind her. She doesn't necessarily cut back on laying, 
they cut back on raising. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe that's not too serious, but we're in July dearth and they don't have enough coming in. Next, they start eating the youngest larvae that hatched. They're not going to feed them. They have to keep the foragers going or the hive would collapse. They have to keep the queen going. The adults are more important. And this continues on until in a really bad July dirt, you open up the hive and all you see is cat brood. And the next time you come in, you don't even see the cat brood. They won't let the, they won't let the queen's eggs grow up at all. So watch for that in July. And that is often when people say, How, do I have a queen? I see no eggs, no young larvae, no uncapped larvae, and the capped larvae that's there is emerging. It's that old. So she has a laid in almost 21 days. And it could simply be they're in dearth. Look at, do they have any pollen stores? Do they have the bee bread ring around the, the brood? And you should already have finished that. But it may mean that your stores are really low, including pollen, which is one of the reasons why I'd say go ahead and feed some pollen sub now. I don't know if they can really store it, but at least they won't have to dip into any real pollen they've got stored if they can use that. All the bees need pollen, not just the young larvae. It, you kind of get that impression, but actually everybody needs protein, vitamins, lipids. We all need it. And nutritional stress reduced is a disease prevention strategy. It is a BMP, a best management practice. I think they stole that from MBAs or something. It sounds so technical when, when we say that as beekeepers. Yes, I practice my, my BMPs. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm a little overtired. <laughs> I'm kind of getting here. Okay, um, do, when you feed, do use entrance reducers or robbing screens and you're watching for the yellow jackets. The smell of that hive is already starting to pull them in. And I'd love to hear, especially at the end of this, are you seeing the yellow jackets? Last year, you took your lid off the hive and they just died for it. You couldn't smash them as fast as they were coming in when you were trying to check your hive. So far, so good this year. But last year there was something that happened and it was, it was free for alls. Luckily I didn't get anything robbed out because I reduced entrances. I, I got so I didn't even check my hives for a couple weeks there. And it doesn't stop right away because wasps and such, like bumblebees, can fly at about 10 degrees lower temperature than honeybees. You'll see a few honeybees straggling out there. But bumblebees are better pollinators for a number of things because they will do those extra hours of pollination in the morning and in the evening. And yellow jackets, they, that gives them that many more chances to sneak in past the guards who might have kind of pulled back from the entrance because it's cold and nobody's going in or out. And so they're actually a higher risk. Ann Harmon did some wonderful talks on sugar presentation. HMF, I don't know if anybody wants me to really explain what it is. Hydroxymethanolfuranose. It is a degradation product of fructose, basically. And it forms if certain cornstarch is where you really find it. And cornstarch that has been made high fructose corn starch that you hear about, it's so bad, oh, it's so bad for you. Well, it's really bad for bees if it's been made with the acid hydrolysis method. And there's another method called the enzymatic. When you buy corn starch, it's not labeled. I mean corn starch, I'm sorry, corn syrup. When you buy corn syrup, it's not labeled which way it was made, and, especially, and it's not labeled how it was stored. The acidity with heat and with time any one or two or all three of those makes HMF, which is very toxic to bees. It, it would be toxic to people too, but we just aren't that dependent on sugar in our diet, no matter how much we seem to eat or like it. But with bees, it is very toxic. When you go to make candy blocks and stuff, I, I put this probably in the wrong place, but a tablespoon of water per pound of granulated white sugar. It's such an easy recipe. And that's from Rusty Burlew. I always recommend her honeybeesweet.com when you want to quick check something. She's got a great, she knows how to run a website and you enter it in the search, your search term in, and you'll often get right to what you need. Something like you want sugar recipes, feed recipes. A lot of you have already decided what kind of feeder to get. 
one of the reasons for doing the winterization talk now is in case you haven't decided or you're going to try a new one, this you may have to order, especially I think Man Lake has finally got its act together. Somebody said that they finally got the catalog that they ordered like over a month ago. So hopefully they're catching up. They got the supply chains working again. But if not, don't wait too long. Uh, and in line, you remember these from if you took the beginning, if you remember that. It's always possible to use a Ziploc, and that's kind of a, that can change the height. It can be a very low profile, depending on what your system is, of how you're going to put the feeders inside, which is the best. And if you're going to do it outside, this is wrong. This should have an entrance reducer right here, so that it's not easy for robbers to sneak right in and around the corner. Make it hard. Leave an inch over here if you're really going to do a board bin. Or even better, put the board bin inside. It's a flat, low-profile feeder that works with top bars that have peaked roofs. I put it in because Frederick Dunn was the one that showed it on his. He's one of the people I recommend for a good YouTube, YouTube video blog. Once a week, and he answers questions and such, too. Oh, this I don't understand. Why Wasba put this in the beginner manual, I don't understand. You never put these directly on the frames. Because if you forget, especially in the springtime, they'll start building from up above. There's no ceiling here. There's no reason they wouldn't build comb from whatever lid you have up above. And that actually happened to someone. And it was, you know, it was horrific. But they, they showed us this. But it isn't true. Don't do that. When you're picking your feeder, you're going to be thinking about how do I get to it to refill it without completely removing the inner cover and disturbing the bees. Because we don't just drop in temperature. We can hover there at that like 55 where you could be feeding them liquid feed during the daytime, still 55, for quite a while. So you want to have something that you can easily get to. Okay, I, I've drummed it. I think, I think I've said enough. I, I am repeating myself somewhat. Solid is really only an emergency food. Sometimes I don't hear people recognize that. It doesn't insulate. The bees aren't right next to it. It's not right alongside of them when they're in cluster. They have to come up and get it. So things have to be warm enough and they have to be mobile enough that they can come up and get it and mix it with water. So probably there's some condensation on the side of their hives. You don't want no condensation. You just don't want condensation dripping on your cluster. So here's some methods where they, this you do often put directly on the, on the frames and use either another hive body, which is really too deep. This looks like a Western. That's a lot of air space in there, but some kind of shim or spacer. And I think here, here's an Emery shim, sometimes called a honey shim. And that's not really the only reason, the only thing you use this for. This is actually, see that little notch there? This narrow shim, people often put it on top of their honey supers to give the bees a second entrance to come in and the foragers can go in, quick drop off of the, the whatever they're carrying, the honey to the receiver bees, or they put the, take their pollen pellets and put, pack them into the, into the pollen cells. If they can do that, coming in quickly through this top, instead of coming through the main entrance, all the way up through the brood chambers, working their way up, it makes more sense. It, it, it does seem like you would probably get a little bit better honey production. So this is called an emery or a honey shim, and this was actually how to do it, not the plans. But a shim is often, here's another one, sometimes it's called a rim too, and sometimes I like to put one eighth inch screen stapled on underneath to hold whatever I've got in there. We're going to talk about moisture absorbency in a minute and, um, and styrofoam too. And stapled bur burlap too. I've got a picture of that coming up. But before we leave feeders, make sure that you are happy with the kind you pick. You're going to try a new one this year. I would order before anything can go wrong with the supply chains. And sugar. <clears throat> actually would not wait until the last minute to get sugar because it was so crazy in the spring. People were running out and they were saying, don't hoard, I'm going out of a beekeeper and it's pouring rain all the way into June. I need the sugar. No, 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 not me. I'm not. <laughs> it's my bees. Okay. It's like when you go in, well, 
you, you probably don't do that kind of treatment, but if you use alcohol and you're actually using ethanol and beekeeping and you're trying to explain, I need the full thing of vodka. Yeah, right. Little ladies, uh-huh, we know. They don't believe me, but that's okay. It's for my bees. It really is. Okay, accessible. So make sure that you're going to be able to monitor it. And in the weather that you're going to have, without chilling the brood, I really recommend internal if you can possibly do it versus the external. But don't cover up your ventilation. You want that airflow going through. Uh, if you can get a 3 8 inch gap between the bars of the top bar and above the top bar, if you can, to, if not, at least something. Where you put it right on the, the top bars, right on the tops of the frame. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading that wrong. It's my own writing. Top bars, if you put the feeder on top, you've got to give them a gap to get up and down. So you're going to have to move the bars of the top bar apart. Okay. I've been trying to put notes in about top bars because people are really fascinated with top bars and they are a little bit different. Early in the spring, can be January, you will suddenly have increased humidity and need for ventilation. Maybe you didn't really need a top vent and you didn't really check it and they propolised it over. You may need to check. And I have a picture coming up of when I noticed it. It was when the brood, when they start to brood up and it's after the winter solstice. Shortest day of the year, don't ask me how the bees know. It's always raining, but I guess it's like they can figure out where the sun is on a totally clouded over raining day. They can somehow sense that the days are getting longer once they pass the solstice and they will start raising the queen's eggs. Hmm. A lot of your feeders, there's a ladder, a mesh, some, you, or you put some straw sticks in to prevent the bees from drowning. Make sure they can always climb out. Look at your feeders. Although bees have been known to fill your feeders with dead bees once the feeder's empty, and people say, oh, they drowned. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes they just have to push the dead bees out of the hive, and they aren't going out because it's too darn cold. So they will put dead bees up on your inner cover, and they also push them into like an empty feeder if you had a frame feeder that you had to leave in there, which is a consideration. If it gets too cold, you may not want to open your hive up, pull your frame feeder out, and put frames in. You may just have to leave it in for the winter and then clean it out in the spring. And robbing risk. And your decisions may be different than commercial. Commercial's gonna go for costs, including labor costs. So if you hear something that conflicts with everything I've already said, I just ask you to think about that. Pollen patties. Everyone I've ever seen make pollen patties makes them too thick and too dry. You want it ooey, gooey, goopy. And you make it with like two to one, forget those recipes. I just mix the powder with two to one syrup. And because sugar is hygroscopic, that'll keep it goopy. You make it peanut butter consistency and you've got all that sugar in there, it, it pulls moisture in. That's hygroscopic. Don't you love those big words? You beekeepers need big words. Now, we get into clusters. How am I doing on time? Am I talking too long without a break? Well, for me, not bad. Everybody awake still? Okay, good. And if you really do have a question, you can stop me. I'm on a roll, but I can be stopped. Winterization. We sit, Now we're going to talk about the cluster. That was the feed, and now we sort of shift focus to the cluster. You want a cluster that's large enough that can form and then actually probably break apart and reform depending on the weather changes outside and be able to move, especially if it needs to move a little side to side to follow the stores and upward. And that's why we say brood to the bottom, stores to the top. Bees tend to move upward and the heat moves up so it's sort of natural for them to move upward. On a top bar, you don't have this system. So I put a picture of a top bar here so I would remember to say, they have to move, but they need to move in one direction. There are a lot of top bar hives out there that are made with a center entrance, and I don't understand that because all the theory that I've read on top bars, everything I've seen, they have to move when it's really cold. They need to be able to move as the brood hatches into where this partial brood mixed with the honey, into the honeycomb pollen stores. If the middle entrance makes them, if the beekeeper's encouraging them to put the brood in the center and the honey to two sides, what happens if there's a sudden freeze 
and the broods hatched out, they moved to one side, uh-oh, sudden drop in temperature, and they can't get to the other side easily. A cluster has to break apart to move. If you have a drop in temperature, it may get stuck on that side. Winterization, we're gonna worry about wind and rain protection, and we're gonna prevent condensation. A wet bee is a dead bee. That, might, that sounds to me like one of those samplers I used to make you embroider when you were a little kid and you're learning how to sew. And you embroider this slogan, frame it and put it up on the wall. And access to the feeder too. I need to be able to get to the feeder and they need to be able to get to the feeder. Large enough. And actually very small colonies can successfully overwinter. However, it would be nice to have the bigger one to, for more insurance. So, Merge colonies, if you have any doubts, healthy ones, you can pick the queen. Now, if you're merging two colonies and each has a queen, you can pinch one, euthanasia. You can put one in a small reserve nuclear, put over to the side and save her until you see that the other one's doing really well and is accepted. I don't know why, nobody knows why, but bees do their own thing sometimes and they might reject one queen. But if you do the, a proper newspaper merge, it usually works. I've never seen it not work. Or you can just say, I can't do this. I can't pinch one. I don't want to put one over to the side. I'll probably have to kill her anyway. So let them duke it out. May the best queen win. You just put them together with a newspaper between the two hive bodies. The strongest colony, that's usually the colony with the most brood, is on the bottom. And then there's, there's going to be some brood up in that other colony, too. The newspaper in between, picture coming up on the next slide, I think. After two weeks, recheck, let them get settled in together, and then shift the frame so that you're still brood to the bottom, storage to the top. This was a sloppy merge that I did. I think it had to do with how I was lifted. I think I also knew that I was going to go back into this hive. It was an early enough merge. I didn't worry too much about the fact that this is obviously the bigger, stronger hive. I just went ahead and put it on. I also wanted that screen bottom board, I think. So I sort of ignored the rule, but I did the newspaper here. And here's the diagram in the beekeeper's handbook, one of my favorite sources. And you'll often see black and white diagrams that after a while you start to recognize they're out of the beekeeper's handbook and we should all give credit and push sales of that because those are nice people, Samatero and Abitabu. Hmm. So there's the explanation of how you do it. It's probably in your notes if you took beginner. Strong colony, newspaper. You can cut the slits if you want to. Oily paper towels. I've never done that. I don't know why you would do an oily paper towel. Maybe they, there might be some kind of theory that if they get a little oil on themselves, they can't smell each other, you know, because they're so busy cleaning off the oil. I don't know. And then the wheat colony. Uh, a split, maybe a queenless colony. Good way to combine the queenless colony. There's some other ways, but this one is kind of the easiest way. I often, if I'm doing this, I often put a feeder up here because I figure this one's gonna be fat and happy, not, not be perceived as robbing this one. But that's something I do. I don't know if everybody does that. We'll talk about that in Apprentice, see if anybody else, what other people think. So your cluster's large enough. Now you need it to have, to be able to form. Well, why would that be a problem? Well, queen excluder. Don't leave the queen excluder in. She can't get through it. Drones, if there's any left, can't get through it. This is going to be difficult for the, for the cluster to form. And as the cluster moves upward, the queen will get left behind. And sorry, there's no loyalty there. It's her problem. She can't cross the excluder and the whole colony moves upward. They can't figure it out. They will just desert her and go up. You will have excess boxes and frames by September. The top bar, you're going to adjust with the follower board, which slides sideways. And you could just move frames that are empty to the side. Why to the side of the follower board, the empty side of the hive? Why do you have excess frames and boxes? Why are your bees rattling around in late September or even early September, if you don't have knotweed coming in, why do you have excess frames? Well, I always recommend over supering. If you're in doubt, Wall Street test, 
do they need another box or not? I don't know. As a, as a beginning beekeeper, just put it on. Every time you see a frame of cat brood, make sure that there are two frames that are essentially empty. The bee that was was in that cell before it chewed its way through the wax capping and came out, that bee that was emerging, worker bee, comes out and then lays down. When it, when it is in the hive, it no longer takes up one cell. Its body covers a good two, if not three. So always, you should always, when you see lots of cat brood, make sure there's empty frames. So this results sometimes in you putting in frames that are not necessary, but it is a swarm control early in the year. Through the blackberry floor, I would say. There's also the queens that chimney. The queens that no matter what you do, will never use those outside frames. They only use the middle eight out of 10. You're lucky if they don't use six out of 10. They're, they're just queens that do this. Or you have an eight frame and they don't like them. They're cold. We have thin walled hives and the workers of the queen are real finicky and they won't use those outside frames. You're gonna need to take that out to get your, your stores and your bees together, well insulated and in a nice 3D arrangement. You, you're, you may be taking off your empty honey supers. So that's actually gonna be boxes coming off. And way back in the height of the nectar flow, all your, even your brood nest frames were covered with that shiny nectar. But it, every two frames of nectar dehydrated and ripened down to only a frame of honey if they didn't need it. So suddenly you have those extra frames. Brood nest population fell, so not all those brood frames, once they finally got the honey out of them, actually have brood in them. And they're, hopefully you've got that population decrease in that lovely blue yellow graph there. And I put this whole thing in. I, what I really put this in was just for this bottom part here. You just start with your two deeps or three westerns in the, in the spring, and you do these various manipulations. Maybe you reverse, maybe there's, you know, it's pretty empty here. You reverse, but you put the first honey super on, and then you put the second one on, and then quite often, you're too busy to go down here and do any rearrangements. And maybe she moves some of the brood up or something, and you put another one on, you can end up with a lot of boxes. And that is a valid method of beekeeping, it works. But you may have a lot of empty frames down here. And by the fall, you wanna be going into winter, basically the same size hive that you're gonna have in the spring. Now, you're enabling that cluster to move up. So you've taken out all this excess stuff, put the brood to the bottom, source to the top, you're also gonna to need to figure out how you're gonna put things in. And this puzzled people, this is the order in which, what your, your hive will look like. Okay, looking, it doesn't really have a, a weight on top like a cinder block, but you got a strap on this hive. Then maybe there's some top insulation there. If you were gonna use, here's a, a shim or spacer or rim, whatever you'd like to call it, with a burlap sheet stable on the underside. I use a lot of 1 8 inch hardware cloth. Or um, window screen I don't use because it's useful to have that one eighth inch hardware cloth there for other reasons. There's times when I can come handy when you're moving a hive or something, that it not be window screen, that it be one eighth inch. Bees will sometimes cluster against a moving screen and if it is window screen, they can actually suffocate everybody behind them. Their bodies actually cover the screen Whereas one eighth inch, there's some airflow that goes through. I don't know if that makes sense, but I recommend doing um, the one eighth inch hardware cloth instead of the window screening that you might naturally say, well, I've got that around. So this is the order. Weight straps, you're insulating, your top insulation. Maybe you've got a moisture shim. Some people like a vent in that. And then, then they've got their uh, feeder shim, candy board, Unless they put the feed right on the frames, it's above the inner cover or right below the inner cover. Below the inner cover is a little more accessible. Dry feed, like I said, they have to be able to move and leave the cluster to come up and get the dry food. 
So sometimes people, that's why they show you pictures of putting it right on the frames. The pollen sub, they often can't get to it if it's on, again, the breaking, I'm thinking after Christmas especially, you know they're gonna brood up no matter what you do, so you might as well let them have some pollen. It's my thinking. So that needs to be right on top of the inner cover or better yet, right under it. And you have two deeps or three westers for your basic hive, unless you're going to do, I, would, I don't recommend doing single deeps or two westerns the first year. You wanna try that strategy the second year, great. Um, you'll have the experience, you can think about it, think about your vocation. Then your mouse guard or entrance reducer and a screen bottom board. I still love a screen bottom board because when I pull the slide out, I can see what they're doing. I can see if they're eating the pollen patty all the way and just nibbling the wrapping and dropping that to the bottom. In the spring, when they uncap the honey, they drop the cappings onto that board and I can see that they're uncapping honey. Uh, I can see, you know, mites of course, I can see if anything looks wrong or anything looks right by using that white slide out. Some more about the clothes. Oh, that's where I intended to actually use that fall management. I, as I said, I just barely finished this presentation. The cluster. Back to the cluster. It contracts and expands with temperature. When the bee's body is reaching 57, it wants to hug. They are cold-blooded. They generate some heat, but all cold-blooded animals do. Remember, they're going to follow the heat up inside the hive. They, if it gets really cold, they have to be in contact with the stores to use them. And they're, if they're moving as a cluster, that's why you want to start with the brood on the bottom so they form down there. The temperature, air temperature inside of the hive is basically the outside temperature. That seems really not counter, that seems counterintuitive. But I've got some diagrams coming up if it helps you understand it. And I'm trying not to just be a beginner level, but to help people who have, are so sick of hearing this because I, here I am preaching again. Got a treat for her, you got to feed. Okay, I got to put something new in. The lowest survival temperature, and it can be incredibly low. There, there are bees that are kept at the Arctic Circle. It depends on the number of bees, the quantity of the stores, the duration of the cold, and I didn't put staying dry. But that's the other one. And they, these are, have this incredible strategy. For a tropical insect to do this is incredible. And this is how they do it. And adenine methyl, I think I, yeah. I, I cut and basted that, so I spelled it correctly. Thank you. <laughs> he does, he speaks at um, Oregon State University and he speaks up in Canada too. This is actually from a Canadian paper. I put the title there. And gorgeous diagrams. This right here, this is, um, th there is a core. And if there's brood, even in January, if there's brood, it still has to be kept. They got everything in centigrade driving nuts. But about 93 degrees is about as low as it can go and develop. They have to, and remember, we're 98.6 inside our bodies. They have to keep any brood. The queen, about 70 degrees for her to be healthy because she really can't move much and they've got to feed her and keep her, they've got to keep her at least like about 70. So this is in centigrade, so I did put a table over here if it helps at all. Uh, partly I put the table because here's where cluster formation happens. Cluster formation is happening. They are breaking up and coming back together right here between 10 degrees, I'm gonna move this down, 10 degrees and 20 degrees. Okay, so look, oops, looking at this, between 10 degrees and 20 degrees. So 50 degrees Fahrenheit and, let me move this again, 68 degrees. That's, so out here, ambient temperature, which might be a little higher than outside, that's where they're forming. And this can happen pretty easily in our climate. I think this can happen very easily inside the hive. I think they do this. I think it complicates all of our calculating stores. Mine, I usually end up leaving more than they need. So I thought these diagrams were really interesting and I could put them on the page if anyone thinks they're useful. But the temperature, oddly enough, when ambient fluctuates wildly, 
this is still said, they love selfies, you know, they're in Canada. And yeah, they were doing it to us from Virginia. We gotta have some decency here. But the way that the cluster doesn't break up as much as you would think with the ambient temperature making big changes. Actually, okay, there we go. Um, Julian date, oh, they're really funny. Okay, Julian date, I, I just realized what that is. Starting with the 1st of January is number one on the Julian date, okay. Learn something new every day. Condensation, you either avoid it or you absorb it. In the avoidance tactics, Condensation is the drippy part. So we're not talking about the moisture necessarily directly. We're talking about let's not let it drip on the bees. So tilting the hive, raising the back, shoving a piece of one by two under the back to tilt it up. Some people leave this year round. It won't cause burr comb problems because this isn't a problem for the bees. If you were to raise the side of the hive, either side an inch, you could end up with burr, bridge, brace comb. The bees could do something funky because they're gravity oriented. But because you're lifting the back and the way the combs are parallel, at least the way we do it in the United States, this is called, I think, the cold way. There are a few beekeepers, I think it's Europe, where they turn the frames inside the hive at 90 degrees. And I think that's called the warm way. What it does is it blocks the cold air that could be coming in the entrance. So there actually is a set of beekeepers who do that. It's rare though in the United States. I, I've seen it discussed, but I don't know anybody who says that publicly that they do it. Anyone's come out of the beehive and told that that's what they do, is turn their, their frames 90 degrees. So we keep ours the cold way, I think is what it's called. So when you raise the back, it's not a problem causing burr comb. It doesn't interfere with the bee space because you don't have the frame swinging into each other. Or into the side of the hive would be really where they would end up touching. Insulating under the outer cover. If you insulate and the warm air rises inside the hive, you don't get condensation right above the bees, right under the outer cover. If you insulate fully, that covers, that cuts down how many surfaces in the beehive are cold. So it might be the floor where water condenses. If you want to adjust the condensation and humidity inside the hive, you can adjust it by sliding the sticky board in and out. Another reason I love those screen bottom boards with the slide out. And monitor the brood activity because I've got a picture coming up where I went, ooh, I didn't need an upper, I didn't need upper ventilation until now. It was January and I needed it. To absorb. The moisture shim or quilt box, as people will call it, it could have anything in it. Uh, they used to actually use a lot of wool, and if you buy certain top bar sets, they use wool blankets on top of the uh, top bar wedges, which are already very insulating because no air passes through that, that top bar, the wedges on the top bar. So you can visualize that on the top bar eyes. That moisture shim will go above the dry feed. Again, if you need help in, in visualizing what we're trying to do, we're trying to not have a cold surface up here at the top. Okay, warm air is rising. Red arrows for warm. And then there's cold. Okay, it hits cold. Okay, if I put an inch or two of styrofoam here, that will keep this from ever being the temperature drop. Even if it does happen, you've got an inner cover here and the water should drip onto your inner cover. That's one of the two reasons for having an inner cover. The other one is so you can get the outer cover off so the bees haven't propolis it down completely. But this is the other reason for having inner covers, is so that when there is a drip, it's going to hit that inner cover and not go straight onto the bees, hopefully. Only if it goes through the hole in the center. So that's sort of being able to see fresh air coming in and how it would work. And then over here, where would you, you're hoping to start your brood at the bottom, stores up above, then your winter feed, the, the, the dry feed after they finished up their honey, 
okay, and hopefully it's warming up in the spring and they can get to it and they've moved up anyway. And then your wood chips or uh, news, I use shredded newspaper works, and then maybe some solid insulation. Oh, don't forget your mouse proof entrance reducer, which goes on before it freezes because mice like to find their nest before it freezes and you can end up shutting the mouse in. Protection from the weather. If you haven't, if you need to move your hives, and there are a lot of people that are finding it's just easier to move the hive than to worry about wrapping, straw bales, car, they just put it under a carport. Not enclosed. Make sure your entrances are clear if you try this. Uh, not inside an enclosed warehouse or shed unless you are a commercial beekeeper and this may look crazy but it, it works and they lower they increase the co2 to lower i think the respiration rate cut down brood raising get a brood break which helps with controlling varroa so that it's lower the varroa mite load is lower on the hive in the spring they also wrap up this is the canadian beekeeper so this is Four hives, I think, wrapped up, and boy, they, they put a piece of bent. It explains what it is, piece of plywood, okay, bent. Uh, but you gotta be careful. You gotta know what you're doing, have a plan. If you decide to do wrapping, talk about it and think about it. Wrapping's a little bit tricky because you can convince a hive that it's really not winter yet. So I recommend that you, I'm going to talk about stage three stages to winterizing and, and make the wrapping it further in, not at the beginning. Top insulation first, maybe. We'll talk about stage one, two, three. Overwintering nukes is something that is really gaining a lot of attention because you can store extra queens. Obviously, if it's a smaller colony, they won't die of the cold if, in this case, they are going to need insulation. Here's some pieces of styrofoam and then they wrapped it with tar paper. They made sure, weighing it, that they had it packed with, with the honey. These, I'm sure these are five frame nukes. They really look like five frame nukes. And this is a strategy a lot of people are doing to overwinter extra queens. If it sounds crazy to do this, they used to call this cellar wintering in root cellars and it was done. This is a 1918 map of the United States where it would be profitable to do it. Uh, zone one, if you can find the little one there, it's profitable. And zone two, they're saying just do it. And of course, you're getting into that, that continental Arctic North winters, getting closer there. And the Agricultural Extension, WSU, Washington State University, is actually looking into going back to this somewhat. Partly because it controls the varroa mite load by controlling the brood raising. You can get that brood break and less stores are used. They're looking at it in old Apple warehouses. You can look this up on the WSU Agricultural Extension site. Interesting. Okay, you're avoiding or you're absorbing. Here's my January. Yay! Look at all that wet water spot there. I knew they were getting more active, so I knew that I could put, it was, it was still cold enough I didn't want to mess with them. So I put the granulated sugar right next to the hole in the inner cover. Here I put the pollen patty right on top of the inner cover and look at all that moisture coming up, just venting right up. Mm -hmm. I, I think I put popsicle sticks all the way around. I don't think this inner cover had a notch and I had styrofoam up here and I didn't have a moisture absorbency because I usually don't need it. I, I sometimes put it in, but you have to watch. If you don't have something in there to absorb moisture, you need to be watching, especially when they ramp up for the brood rearing or the weather changes. I recommend that if you're going to look at top bar hive insulation and moisture absorbency and such, look at the Valkyrie Hive website. That's a Langstroth Long, the Langstroth Long Deep Hive system. And I thought she had some interesting ideas on how to handle that. So do your winterization in three stages. If you were to, as soon as it got a little bit cold at nights, got down to the first nights, it gets down to the 40s, and you slap all the wrapping on and the top insulation, and you do everything at once, I think it could backfire on you. And I, and I read this, and a couple of other people thought this too. So this is my theory. Before the temperatures drop, you pulled out all those excess frames and boxes. 
change to a telescoping lid or a peak roof, not a migratory. A migratory is flat. And I and this kind of roof, this is a looks like a dish pan to me. And it's the type of lid that is being sold now. Uh, Snohomish Bee Company is doing it. This is just a piece of metal. It's sort of telescoping, but not what we generally mean by telescoping. It, it, it allows, if, it's, if it sits absolutely flat on top of your top hive body, it wouldn't let air flow in, but it's all metal. There's no natural insulation in this, not even your normal wooden type. So watch out if you get this, I assume that it's intended to be used with insulation right underneath it. That's all I can figure. Okay, and I do top insulation. You can even leave the top insulation on year round. It's like the tilting one inch by raising the back one inch, tilting it. Some people do it year round. They say, I, I, I got too much to think about already. I'm just leaving it that way. The only thing it might affect some of your liquid feeders if you were always tilted. Straps, weighted or weight the lid down. That might be a really good idea. You never know what's gonna happen between freak windstorms or animals that get a little too curious. Honey is insulation too, don't forget that. This is stage one. You're thinking about doing this stuff. You're not wrapping yet, uh, but you gotta get that mouse guard on before it freezes. And then this is gonna be your last stage. This is what you're gonna be taking off or changing late in the spring. And people had a hard time understanding this when I talked about it, and I can't do anything in person. This is so frustrating on Zoom. So this is what I stack up. This is what I'm stacking. So I prefer a screen bottom board, but I didn't have one to spare, except for this homemade one where they cut it out. But if I did have it, I'd do that with the slide out on the bottom. Mouse guard, unless you're sure you can do your wooden. And if so, you can do your wooden entrance reducer. Your three uh, westerns on top or two deeps. Here's my inner cover, okay? So I did it like that. Bottom board, slide out, three westerns or two deeps, whatever you're using. Then on top is your inner cover. I use, if you're using jar feeders, they go right on top. And then on top of that, you need, you need a support to enclose those jars. So that went here. And then I put a moisture shim, because it's a good idea. I mean, and it's and it's very absorbing. The mine was shredded paper. A lot of things work, wood chips or whatever. And then this is my styrofoam sheets. Another, you call it a shim or a spacer or a rim. Up on top, and especially if you have that metal thing, you better, that metal funny lid, they're calling a lid now, you would really want to have something insulated because metal conducts both ways. Heat out of the hive. And that's a true telescoping lid that when it's flipped over, the sides come down around. Then I would add a strap because this is getting pretty tippy by the time I do these separate little parts here. There's different ways you could do this. This would end up tippy enough, I would put the cam lock. Here's a cam lock strap on my wrapping. I use Reflectix later on wrapping. But stage one, we're just getting up to here, maybe this part on. Not wrapping yet. It gets to freezing at night. So that's sort of how I think of it. If you haven't raised the back of the hive yet, do it for sure. Maybe you didn't do it because your liquid feeders were on. I put the night count board in until I see a moisture problem. Liquid feed, not feed. Liquid feed is coming out because you're freezing at night, you're dropped, you drop definitely. They're not taking it anymore. You, you're probably dropping below the 50, 55 at the day. You're putting on your dry feed shim, uh, which is, a, if it's a, it'll be right below your inner cover, right above. So you're gonna do it quickly so you don't chill anything. Then your moisture box, your quilt box, you're switching over to that dry feed pollen sub which would have to be pretty much right on the frames if you're gonna be giving any more of that. And maybe you've got a small top vent so that you can control the moisture at the top, especially if you see a big wet spot like I saw. And there is a strategy for no top vent. Talk to me about it or somebody before you do it. I have successfully done it until you get to January and then the brood rearing stepped up and didn't work so well. That's when I went ahead and, and opened up a small top bent. But there are people who never top bent. And there are parts of the country where they never top bent. 
and I guess like Southern California, places that are lower humidity, they can do it and just do the tilt, the moisture absorbency, da da da, and they don't drown their bees. Stage three is a full wrap. You've got your entrance reduced down as far as you can. Everything else is on. And then you're going to reverse. You're going to work backward in the spring. You're going to take the wrap off. You're going to open up the entrance some. You're going to um, switch from the dry feed to the liquid feed. You're going to reverse these three stages. Now you just have to monitor for the winter. And remove the dead from the bottom board. Make sure that the, you can check your slide out board. Um, just make sure the bees can get out, preferably both entrances, top and bottom. Make your notes <coughs> and store your equipment, store your honey, um, freeze for wax moth. Wax moth, yeah. I have to put a note about wax moth. The bug zapper did seem to help this year. I, I put a bug zapper on a timer, so it came on for like an hour or two in the evening after, when there couldn't be any bees flying, and it's winter too. And the open air and circulation just doesn't work well enough, unless you can get it right up against a window. And I tilted that high body right up by a window. It's just too dark in my sheds. I only have small. And the wax moths don't like the light. They don't like the air circulation. And I assume they get zapped by the bug zapper because it did seem to help. The other options are chemical, like PDB, the paradiacorobenzene, or paramoth. I think it's sold under paramoth. Not the mothballs. Not, mothballs are naphthalene. Naphthalene is toxic to everything, which is why they sell. But, but paradichlorobenzene, if it would be toxic to bees, but it airs out of the wax better, almost completely, whereas the naphthalene can't air out. Hmm. I think, I'm thinking acetic acid might work. I got to look that up. Acetic acid is used for I think Nosema as well, and I was gonna look that up. The British beekeepers tend to do more work with fumigating and also cleaning and sanitizing frames, which is something I wanna explore in an apprentice. It's not highly recommended that you try to sanitize anything with bleach or lye or acetic acid. Um, yeah, those are the three I can think of. Okay, so you're down to seeing if everything survives, if you did anything right. You get horrible dead outs, take these horrible pictures, and autopsy. I highly recommend, and there are people who something goes wrong, top blows off, gets knocked over. I highly recommend that you not just straighten it up and leave it there to be robbed out, to have the ants move in or the mice move in. Actually would remove and store. You don't want to lose your wax because five to ten pounds of energy of honey to make a pound of wax. And a pound of wax goes pretty far, but it, it's, a, it's a resource that you have next spring. Any honey or pollen that's good, if you can get it into your freezer, unless you can, sometimes if it's late enough in the spring, I did ha one time have a dead out, and I just looked at that much honey and said, hmm, this one's going to need some feed, and I just, on the warmest day I could get, quickly put a honey, a super of honey right on top of another hive and had that benefit of that in the spring. But do something. Don't say, oh, they'll rob it out. That's true, but it might be your neighbor's bees bringing in diseases. It might be the yellow jackets that get attracted and notice that there's brood here. Hmm, they can rob later. There's a bee journal. I promote that ridiculously. So in the basic summary, we start now because we can't trust our Pacific Northwest weather. It's just too variable. If you procrastinate on ordering your supplies and making your plan, something will go wrong. And life is busy. You're working full time, you may have five days of the week, you can't go out anyway, and that will be the sunny weather you could have gone out. It rains on the weekends, right? That's the way it works in the Pacific Northwest. Try to take your losses now on week highs. Combine them. Let them die. Don't try to, it's a waste of, of energy for you. It really is. If there's any way you can merge them, do it. If, you, if that's the only hive you've got, okay, insulate, wrap, do, do all this other stuff. And it's good experience, even if you lose them. The cond condensation, the dripping on them, the starvation, those are all more dangerous than the cold. The mild temperatures are actually a problem. 
and our humidity are actually a problem. And more activity, when you see them, they're awful busy, mm -hmm. you're in trouble because they're using up their stores faster. Uh, remember to clear the entrances. Sounds really silly, but people forget of those really long hive tools work. A bent clothes hanger works. The dryer lint brush works if you don't get caught borrowing it for your beehives. Got to remember to return it so you don't get caught. And do pick up or seal out your, your dead outs. Don't leave them out there. They're a resource. Why waste it? You've done all this work. Even if your hives don't survive, you still have wax. You have experience. You may have some honey or even nectar. It's <clears> open <throat> to freeze it fast.